Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we're going to talk about endocarditis, the classification, localization and macroscopic appearance and also the etiology, symptoms, diagnosis and therapy. Let's get started. Endocarditis is the inflammation of the endocardium, so of the innermost layer of the heart. Just to revise it, I want to mention the layers, the endocardium in the most inside, then the myocardium, the muscle layer, and the pericardium, the outermost layer. I want to mention the classification. Endocarditis can be either non-infectious, infectious, or a mixed form. The non-infectious form is also called abacterial, and there we can either have an antigen-antibody reaction, for example in endocarditis rheumatica, which is the most common form of endocarditis, and it usually occurs two weeks after infection with a beta-hemolysing group A streptococcus, and um, there we have ward-like vegetations. Vegetations are kind of small clumps, and they are uh, consisting of fibrin and thrombocytes, and these vegetations are primarily deposited at the mitral and at the aortic valve. Also, a deposition of immune complexes can occur, for example, in the liebmann sachs endocarditis, in systemic lupus erythematodus, and there are larger ve vegetations at the mitral, at the aortic, and at the pulmonary valves. Also, there is a tendency to develop a local inflammatory infiltration at these vegetations, and it's often accompanied by pericarditis or pleuritis. So the inflammation of the outermost uh, covering of the heart or the pleura. The infectious endocarditis can be bacterial. This can be subdivided in acute or subacute with a duration of less than two weeks or just a few days in the acute form and more than two weeks in the subacute form. The acute form is often caused by Staphylococcus aureus and it's ha happening especially in IV drug users. And the subacute form is often caused by Streptococci of low virulence, for example Streptococcus, Streptococcus viridans, and also by Enterococci. The fungal infectious form of endocarditis is often fatal in approximately 50% of cases and it's often caused by, caused by Candida albicans. It also happens often in IV drug users but also in patients with a prosthetic valve or in immunocompromised patients. These fungi form a biofilm around the valves and also they penetrate into the endothelial walls. Another causative agent is Aspergillus, is responsible for around 25% of the fungal endocarditis. The viral endocarditis can be caused by a row of viruses. I'm just going to mention the most common ones. Those are the adenovirus, the Epstein-Barr virus, the human herpes virus number 6, and the cytomegalovirus. A mixed form of endocarditis is when there is a bacterial infiltration of a originally non-infectious endocarditis. Also the locali localization can be different. It can either be endocarditis valvularis, so that it affects primarily the valves, and here Staphylococcus aureus often builds a yellow-greenish uh, color on the vegetations on the valves. Also uh, endocarditis parietalis can be seen. It's more rare and it affects the walls of the atria and the ventricles. Endocarditis can also be divided in its macroscopic appearance. This is primarily relevant for the pathology. And here we differentiate four different types. The endocarditis serosa, where there's a reddish, shiny swelling of the valves. 
endocarditis ulcerosa, where there's an inflammation with ulcerations. Endocarditis polyposa, where there's a mix of polyps and ulcerations. And endocarditis varicosa, where there are wart-like vegeta vegetations on the edges of the valves. Now I would like to say a few sentences to the etiology. So when there is a change in the blood flow or in the coagulation, so when the hemostasis comes out of order, then that can lead to a non-infectious thrombi formation. So when the endothelium of the endocardium is damaged, then um, the coagulation cascade is changed, and then we have this thrombi formation. But that I will explain somewhere in another video. And then when there are these thrombies, then this can lead to the deposition of immune complexes or to the accumulation of pathogens, and then these vegetations are formed. Also, further destruction of the valves, the endocardium itself, the papillary muscle, and the cordy tendine can occur. Just to mention it again, the cordy tendine are these small fibers that attach to the valvular cusps, and that can impair also together with the destruction of the papillary muscle and of course of the valves itself can lead to a um, change in the opening and closing of the valves. Also I want to mention that a infectious endocarditis can occur in priorly healthy val valves so there doesn't have to be an underlying heart disease for endocarditis to occur. Now I just want to mention a few symptoms how the disease will look like. So in 80 to 90% of all patients, there will be fever observed, also very frequently seen in 80 to 85% is a change in heart murmurs or occurrence in heart murmurs and tachycardia, so a rapid pulse. Still quite often seen, but only in 40 to 75% is night sweat and shivering and also in approximately a fourth to a half of the patients, there will occur weight loss. The diagnosis is done by primarily echocardiography, so the observation of the heart under ultrasound, there can also be seen the blood flow is there if there is some kind of obstruction or turbulence, and also a microbiological examination in hemoculture is done to see if the um, culture is positive or culture negative. Here it has to be uh, remembered that there are fastidious bacteria that might take longer to be cultured. So it's advisable to keep the hemoculture a little bit longer than usually to see if there's maybe some kind of fastidious bacterium. Then I want, want to quickly mention the therapy, but that of course depends on the patient, on the underlying cause. But just for completeness sake, I want to mention that it's usually done by immune suppressors, antibiotics if we have a bacterial infection, and antimycotics for fungal infections. Also, a valve replacement might be necessary, depending on how damaged the valve is by this inflammation. That's it for now. I hope it was helpful. If you liked the video, please subscribe and yeah, give me a thumbs up and hopefully we see each other in the next video.